I've been reading a lot of books on different presidents here lately. Just, just somewhat, ever since killing Lincoln, I've never been a, his, a history buff, but I read Killing Lincoln a while back, and of course I'm a big reader, and I followed it through with these different president books. I picked this one up, and I'm just absolutely loving it. Something I didn't know about Thomas Jefferson, and something I really didn't even, I, I guess I've never, i never grasped this, and, and, and it's a, and it's a very beautiful thought, and especially somebody like me who loves philosophy. Thomas Jefferson loved history because he believed that history was nothing more than our philosophies, our worldviews being played out in the world scene. All right? I guess that makes sense. We've all heard, what, if you don't know history, you're what? Doomed to repeat it. Repeat it. That's not actually true. It's if you don't understand the philosophies behind what made that history possible, and you repeat the philosophy of that time, that worldview, how you understand things, you are doomed to repeat the history of what? So history is nothing more than the action that comes out beside the behavior. I'm probably talking way up here. I understand that, but I think this is a good foundation so you can understand at least what I'm about to tell you. How many of you believe that we live in dangerous times? Pretty much all of you but my son. Um, son, you were late for church. You have no idea how dangerous a time this is for you. <laughs> no idea. Even though I don't have my glasses on. What, here's my question for the congregation today. It's a simple question right here. That's not there, is it? What is the value of a human being? Can anyone tell me? What is a human being worth? About eight bucks. Eight dollars. You, what is that? That's the chemical. Is that just your view of humanity? Or is that, is that like, all right, I'll take one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eight bucks. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I'll take 160 for y'all. Is that what you're thinking right pretty, pretty much? That's a pretty good deal. Uh, actually, when it comes to the chemical compound, I, I googled it, so it must be true. It's on the internet. Go to the next slide. $1,985. Yeah, that's right. If you were to take all of the chemicals out of the human being, I don't know how this is true. I mean, 92 <coughs> pounds of oxygen? Uh -huh. How much does that cost? I, but anyway, according to the internet, and the internet's all-knowing, it's got to be true, says that the human being is worth $1,985. All right, if you were to break it all down. John, you're, you're disagreeing, aren't you? Well, they're breaking it down into the elements. Actually, the more complicated biological compounds are worth more than their constituent elements. Does anyone else understand why I said that's why we have to yeah. go? All right. So, John, <laughs> tell us, how much is a human worth, approximately? Well, lawyers figure this out all the time because you have to pay somebody. John's a lawyer. Mm -hmm. You have to pay somebody like a, a wrongful death action. Okay. If you run somebody over and kill them, somebody sues you. They have to figure out, well, what's this worth? Okay. And so, it it varies from person to person depending okay. on. Okay. Some people are worth more. <laughs> some people are worth less. Yeah. Yeah. But but I'd say I'd say about ten million dollars. A person. How many of you would sell John for $10 million right now? <laughs> You're pretty much right, John. I can see it. Uh, how many of you would go nine million? Do I have any takers? Nine million. So, John, you're actually worth less than $10 million, according to them. Uh, no, I'm kidding. So, you're saying it's really high. But based on the chemicals, they're saying 1985. But you're saying you've got to do how much they can earn in a living, how much value they brought to the earth, how much time they got left. And, and you're saying around $10 million. That's a lot. That's a lot of money because I really don't think humans value humans that much. I don't. I really don't think so. Um, I don't think the worldview in which we live, the philosophy in which we live, I don't think we see the world in that way. When we look at a human, we're like, that person is worth to me ten million dollars. I don't see. It. I don't see. It. Um, I'll give you a few examples. I'll give you a few examples. Can anyone tell, now of course some, you, you understand this, some, especially if you understand insurance, some people uh, bring 
income and value into a home. Is there anything in the house, any person in the house, or type of person in the house that generally is a large draw in a house? Kids. Children. Children. How much is my child or Andrew worth? That's a good question. Andrew looked up in the air as if he was calculating how much value you bring in the house. Forty. Four dollars a week is what he has to bring into the house. He has to pay for his insurance and his phone and whatever. Children do not bring value into the house. Uh, I think as a society and our culture, all right, and, and we'll get to why I think this, I think for the most part we don't put any value in children as a whole. I'm not talking about we don't place value in our children, but I'm saying as a society as a whole, we don't put a lot of value in. Children. And I would suggest one of the number one, and I'm looking for something that would back this up, as a society and as a culture, we kill our kids. We abort our children. Okay, there's the thing. January 22nd, 1973. This is a big holiday that's coming up. It's my birthday. Uh, when I was three years old, Roe versus Wade came into existence. Had it been a few years before, my 16-year-old mother, well, 16 when she had me, probably would not have had me just because the situation that she was in. Very difficult situation. So, um, so 1973, we celebrate, if you will, Roe versus Wade, where we kill millions and millions and millions of children every year. And most of you don't even think about it. When's the last time you just sat down and thought about all the children that die every single day? For the most part. When we talk about children, we talk about children as being what? A burden. That, that's actually a quote from a president one time. We talk about children as what they were going to cost me. There is a, a, a computer program that I saw this on Google. I wanted to know what does a child cost a human being? Right there. There's a website that has a calculator. And the purpose of this calculator is to help you determine about whether or not you're going to have the child that is within your womb. Okay? Mm -hmm. Ladies, guys, you don't have children in your womb. In case you haven't figured that out. Uh, John's a lawyer. He knows a biologist. He'll show you this. Anyway, most women in Illinois, you, you put your state in there. I went to Illinois. And most of the births that are, are coming about in Illinois are not from married people. I don't know if you know that. The numbers are actually higher. You're more likely to be single. So I put, I'm a single woman. I got a lot of personal messages after I did that. Um, and I make less than $60,000. Because most women in Illinois, single moms, make a lot less than $60,000. I said, how much would a baby cost you? How much do you think the first baby, how much do you think a baby would cost you the first year? $7,500. And I think they were putting rent in and power and portion right there. And then they asked me, am I going to send my kid to college? I'm like, I'm a single mom. You know, I barely make $30,000 a year. So I put no. It told me how much a child was going to cost me until I was 18. $160,000. Andrew, you owe me money. <laughs> I have like five kids. I mean, that's like six, seven hundred thousand dollars Where did it go? It's the question. I mean, you, you, you look at it in the media, you look at it on television. I, I, I don't care what shows that I watch, but sometimes whenever this, this whole baby thing comes about, I mean, and, and the discussion never happens before they have a baby on television. It is always after the fact. And after they get pregnant, the question is, what? Should we have it? I got in an argument with the, the other day with the, with the, with the young man, and, 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 and he was arguing pro-abortion, or he said pro-choice, and I said, no, that's pro-abortion. I mean, if, if your way gets the way, babies die, and I was offered pro-life, and, and he said, you would even force a woman who's been raped to have an a, a, abortion, or you would even force a woman who was going to die to have an abortion? I said, I'm not, I don't want to argue that right now. But let's just pretend for one second, one second, that we would agree that in the cases of rape and incest and a woman's life, we'll allow abortion. But all the other abortions are off the table. Would you support it right now? He said, no. Why? Because it's not a matter of that. It's a matter of what? Choice. What's this child going to cost me? My career? My time? 
we wait? What's the value of that life? That scares me. Let me tell you why. Who else produced very little in our culture today? Disabled. Disabled. <laughs> I'm going to go with a, a, a broader population. I'm going to say the elderly. Mm -hmm. The baby boom is upon, the baby boomers, I guess about 50 some years ago, Americans got busy. <coughs> and now their kids are growing and they're going to retire in great numbers. Okay. I want you to take that as, as, as a fact. We're going to have a lot of senior citizens in the next decade. In the next couple decades, I'll be one of the senior citizens, and most of you will be one of the senior citizens if, if you're not there. You, there's going to be a whole bunch of senior citizens, okay? You got that, you got that factor in your head. Let's add another factor, okay? Right now, 33% of Medicaid, okay, that's $400 billion, $400 billion, 33% of all Medicaid, state and federal, goes to support senior citizens in the last several months of their life. It's the long-term care. A majority, almost 33% now before you even get to the baby booth right there. Got that factor in, in your head, okay? Now let's add another factor. Right now, government is taking over most of the medical fields, okay? <coughs> Just add that factor in. We've already proven that we have a culture that says we will look at the value of a human life. You know, if I were to say this out loud, most people would laugh. In fact, I think when it was stated a couple of years ago, they did laugh at those politicians who did state it. Death commissions. People who one day will look at a paperwork and say, you guys know we have a debt problem in this country? Mm -hmm. You know we have limited resources, right? Mm -hmm. They're going to look at it and say, these people are not worth spending <coughs> one dollar on. They're worth less. Well, that's funny. That's, that's laughable. We won't do it. We've already proved that we will get rid of people if they don't mean much to us, if they will cost us. Absolutely, we would do this. I, you know, I would argue. Again, I'm looking at the worldview, I'm looking at the philosophy, and I'm looking at the history. And the history has shown time after time that if there's a population that values some people less, that over time, if they cost too much, that part of the population will exterminate the other part of the population. That's history. That's history. That's worldviews played off. Right there. Listen to our language, our lingo. Have you ever said, or have you ever heard, what kind of life is that anyway? To the disabled, we hear that. Or the sick. What kind of life is that anyway? We should just kill them. Here, I'll hit you all real, really hard. Prisoners. Life-saving procedures for a prisoner who's going to spend the rest of that life in jail. How many of you thought or said maybe the money could be better spent elsewhere? Well, why would you say that? Because their life isn't worth much. They're worth less. That's the culture in which we live. That's the worldview in which we live. I would argue the reason we have this worldview and this culture is because we saw those little pictures all growing up where you got this little fish coming out of the water and then you got a little monkey and you got a little monkey turned into a little ape and you got a little ape turning into a little human and we have, we, we've come to grasp this idea that we are nothing more than animals, that life is meaningless and who gives a damn if you die or not. What I need to know is what value do you have of me? I would argue that. I know, I know that you guys, most of you brothers and sisters, grew up in Christ. You have a Christian worldview. You have this God. You have this idea of God in you. But I'm telling you right now, children are growing up all over this country that will never have any idea. I've never, ever, ever even heard or even thought of the idea of a God my entire life. Until I was well in my 20s. I had that worldview. Very atheistic in nature. Well, that's 
that's them, of course, that's not you. Well, let me ask you about you real quick. How quickly are you willing to throw people away? Anybody ever tick you off? Those people who are thorns in your side, family members, co-workers, friends, church members, their very existence to you is a costly one. How quick are you willing to throw them aside? Get rid of them. What about people in need? It's funny, but sad. This church, we were small, always been small, we struggle. The people in this community call us up for food. I have a church in this community where they get thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars every week. And when somebody is in need, their members in their church says, call Pastor Mike, they'll help you. <laughs> I kid you not. Those people come, and they come, and they come, and they're in need, and you help, and eventually, you're costing me too much. How many times has there been a person in your life that needed something, and you're like, you know what, it's, I'm done with you. You cost too much. We do it. Why? Because we place value on somebody. <coughs> See, Christian, you're not killing somebody. That's really no kudos to you. As a Christian, you're commanded to love thy neighbor as yourself. You're commanded to be the good, the, the good Samaritan. You're commanded to, when you see somebody in need, it doesn't matter you what value that they have, you're commanded to reach down into the ditch. You're commanded to take those bloody, beaten individuals up and lift them up. You're commanded to take them to the place that they can find out. You're commanded to invest your life into them. But let's be honest, just for a second, even as, as Christians, we ask the question, we get nothing in return, why should I do this? Why? It's a good question. Who likes breaking things? Krista, come up here. Your hand is up first. Oh, wow. <laughs> now, there are some people in here that do not want you to break this. Sure. Apparently, this is an antique jar. Oh, then why do you have it? <laughs> I'll tell you why. Because you break things. Because I break things. If you don't know me, I break things. I'll put this aside. Hold the hammer. Before you break this, I do want to tell you how I got this. <laughs> you ready? Mm -hmm. Let me tell you how I got it first. Put my hand here. Okay. <laughs> See this silver block? Mm -hmm. Don't break the block. Okay. When I was a little kid, I don't even know how old I was. I know my parents are still married. I can tell you the street we lived on Queensway in Dobbinstown. Does anyone know where that is? That's a rough, rough neighborhood, huh? I, after, after my parents got divorced, I lived on Fairfax. You know where that is? Yeah. Amen? That's, that's like, hey, yeah. that's the slums right there. Yeah. I grew up on Fairfax. Poor, poor, poor kid. All right. But anyway, on Queensway, I lived there, and I remember the house, the little white house. We, we ripped out the garage. We, we made that into a room. We were doing some landscaping, and I remember picking up this rock. It was about that big. Okay, but I was a lot smaller, so that rock was probably only about that big or so. Mm -hmm. So it was before my parents got divorced, and I picked up the rock, and it's a true story, and I, and I was moving it right there and, and doing this as a little kid, and the rock, this is how I busted the fish tank, by the way. It slipped. I've been breaking things ever since. And it fell down, and it slammed on my toe. Do you know what happens when you take, like, if you, any carpenters out here, do you know what happens if you take this hammer right here and you snap it on your thumb? What happens? It hurts. Well done. Yeah, it hurts. There's our lawyer. That's worth two million dollars, man. So, um, your the blood vessels underneath it blow up. It, in fact, that's what happened. I dropped it on there. 
it was such a violent force that the blood splattered underneath my nail, shot forward in, in there. I mean, it busted that nail. And immediately it turned, it swells. I was blessed that it at least busted it through that way because there was no pressure. That pressure would have drove me crazy. But as a kid, I mean, I remember this, um, some of this is based on what my, my parents tell me, but for like, I wouldn't let anyone touch it. Okay. You're not touching the foot I just hurt, which is a problem because if you know after a while the nail does what? Falls, Falls off. Well, mm -hmm. mine was just hanging on. So I have this nail that's just barely hanging on uh, right there, and it's nasty, it's infected, and, and stuff like that. So they need to take the nail off and clean that and wrap it with, so you understand where I'm coming from. So, But I wouldn't let anyone touch it. So what happened was a couple weeks went by. Based on what they're telling me, uh, I, now I remember this part. They took me to my grandfather's house. And my grandfather, I, I tell you what, very cold man, never really knew the guy. I think one Christmas I, he gave me this bowling ball, plastic bowling ball with these pins. But other than that, I just don't really remember anything about him. Died shortly after this. He said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do, boy. He sat me down on, it was like a washer and dryer. And he said, I'm going to blindfold you. He took this job. Filled it up with water. He said it's magic. He said, I'm going to blindfold you. And he had my, my foot exposed. So you're going to drink this water, take it down, take the blindfold off. Be all that. So he had to put the blindfold around me, came to the, the jar, I slammed it. And then he took the, the, the blindfold off, and he was roughing it around. You know what he was doing. He was just making the pain go, you know, just kind of distracting me. He took the blindfold off, and my foot was, the nail was gone. That's the job. So you are free to break it, if you like. No, I know you're right. Hold on. <laughs> I will pay you five dollars to break this. <laughs> Rick wants to vote on this. <laughs> You're not gonna no? I want more people. You want more. I have more. The chart is of no value to you. Actually it's gonna cost you not to break it. Why wouldn't you do that? Not worth it. But it's of no value. Why not break it? I just want to know why. Why? Yeah. Because they don't want it to happen. So okay. I, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I value that. friendship better than I do a job. So, because this is valuable to somebody else, mm -hmm. you're not going to break it. And it's going to cost you. That's fine. All right. You can give her a round of applause. I think the truth of the matter is that some humans are of no value to us. They're not. It's a great scripture though, and I want to share it with you. This is in the Psalms. It's behind me. Psalm 8. 43 says this. What is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. You have made them a, low, a little lower than the angels and crowned them with the glory and honor. You make them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under your feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish of the sea, all that swim the paths of the sea. There's a story behind that bottle and because the story is, is, is very passionate, if you will. It, there's meaning and value to that to somebody else, probably somebody that I hope Krista would say is my friend. <coughs> she would destroy this. There's a story behind every human being alive today. Though the world doesn't tell us, the world says they're just accidents, they just come into be being, it's, it's quite meaningless, but there is a story behind every human being. It's God. I mean, when I think of the Holy Scriptures and I think of the story right there now of what it tells us, I mean, you have um, 
uh, you put the New Testament, the Old Testament together, and you got this picture of Jesus Christ as the Creator. It says in John, it says that everything that had been created would not have been created if it wasn't for Him. It says in the Old Testament that everything that exists was literally spoken into existence. Did you know the space between me and John right now is not nothing? It's space. Okay? What, what a, a, an unbeliever, an atheist, if you will, somebody who denies the existence of everything says nothing exists, not even space existed, there was nothing. Okay? And it just popped into existence. And then everything that we had today over a long period of time came into existence. The Bible tells us that God is the first cause. God is the one who spoke this into existence. The triune God, in all, in, for eternity past, came and spoke it into existence, and literally the space between me and John was spoken into existence. Light was spoken into existence. Planets were spoken into existence. Everything on this earth was spoken into existence, except for one thing. Man. Humans. It was that a pre-incarnate Jesus, and I can just see this, got on his hands and knees, and it says that he formed man into taking care, precision, love for man in his own image. Not that we look like him, but that we share the same characteristics as him. We seek justice. We seek mercy. We seek compassion. We love. How many of you think love is one of the greatest attributes ever given to us? I do. You know what's funny though? Love is also why we are in the situation we're in. You ever heard that if you love something, set it free? If it comes back, it leaves the jurors. If it doesn't, hunt it down and kill it. <laughs> that's probably not the, that's not the, no, okay. <laughs> It says it never was. God in the garden said, you're free to eat from every tree but one. You have the choice. You can disobey me. Understand the day you disobey me and you separate me from you. And we choose. We, every day we choose. Every day we choose to sin. And every day we choose to separation from Him. Yet God in His glory before the very creation of the world pictured this. From Genesis 3 all the way through, there's the bloodline. I can show you in the prophecies. I can show you over and over and over again how thousands of years, it's always this. It's always this. This is the story right here. That's it. Nothing more, nothing less. That's the story of the cross. Why? Because not only did he create us, but he was going to buy us back. There's a story behind every human, behind every fetus, behind every poor person who is homeless out there, there's a story that God loves them and he cares very much about him. Now, if you're in the world and you don't care a, a, a lick about God, that's your choice. And, and you know what? I, I'm glad he gave you the choice. But if you're somebody who loves God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your body, when you come up to any person, any person at all, Regardless of the value that you have, their value to you, you need to understand that it is extremely valuable to God. So here's my thought for the day. I'm not going to keep you here too long. Here's my thought. How you treat others. Well, let, 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 let's do this based on the sermon illustration. Actually, Chris, I'm very glad you didn't write this because it really would have spoke about not your need for the bottle, but your relationship to me. Wouldn't it? You didn't give a damn about me. It's easy to break a bottle. But the closer our relationship is, the harder it was to break this. Maybe even impossible. You said $5. There may, there may have been an amount I could have reached, but for the most part, it's real hard. Same thing with God, isn't it? Our relationship to Him, the better it is, the more impossible it is to devalue something that He holds in such great light. 
So think about this, brothers and sisters, and listen to this statement. The way you treat the least of these is a great <laughs> reflection of your relationship with God. And I say the least of these, not the most of these. All right? Although I don't think that there's really different. We're the one who puts the least of these behind it. The fact of the matter is there are some people who are extremely valuable in your life. You have people that, that, that are relatives. You have friends in the church. You have people that you would die for. I know that. I know mo most of you right here, I, I know intimately, and I know that there are things that you would do for people that goes beyond imaginations. But I'm here to tell you right now that that's of no credit to you. It's good but if you love those who love you, and I think I'm stealing this from somebody, that's of no credit to you. Why? Though it can explain that you love God and that's why you do it, but it's just as likely to explain that, you know what, we're sometimes willing to invest our time and energy into somebody who is giving us a return. It's really no credit to you if you love somebody who loves you. Your command is to love those who are the least, no value. Let me share a passage with you. Um, the passage is Matthew. It will, will not be up there, but the scripture reference is up there. <clears throat> I'll read it fast. Matthew 25, I'm going to start with verse 34. This is uh, the end time. It says, then the king, and then uh, as we know of this parable, the king of Jesus says, will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance the kingdom prepared for since the creation of the world. Watch this. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needed clothes and clothed you? When did we see you sick or in prison or go to visit you? The king replied, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Let me ask you this question. Do you think for one moment that Jesus is the one in prison? That Jesus committed the crime. That Jesus broke the law. That Jesus is the prisoner in prison. When you go to visit him, that's really Jesus. Jesus didn't commit a crime. Jesus is not in prison. Now we can look at the Holy Spirit. I think that, that, that we, could, we could take that from this text. I'm not going to go there right now. Do you think it's Jesus who is naked running down the street and needs clothes? Do you think it's Jesus who needs hunger, who is hungry and needs food? Do you think it's really Jesus who is thirsty and needs a drink of water? I think the scripture says that strangers might be angels, but I don't think necessarily that's Jesus. But every single time, Visit those in prison. You feed the hungry. You give a drink to those who are thirsty. You clothe the naked. You invite the stranger in. You're saying, Father God, these are the least of these, but because you value them so much, and, I, and you are important to me, come in, have a drink, have a bite. Visit them in prison. Not because of their value to you, but because of his value. take after those values because we love him. We protest. We protect. We preserve. We pay. There's a bunch of P's in there. Let me quickly explain what I mean on this. We protest. Why is the church silent to this day right now on issues of abortion? Why for the most part? Is it because it happens so much we're desensitized to it? Yes. Why? Is it because there are bozos out there that are really hateful and say things to women who have struggled and gone through crisis and made the decision? Yes. They didn't represent us well. But that doesn't stop our protest. The Bible says this, brother, if you can put that scripture up there. It says, 
Open your mouth. Judge righteously. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. Now, I think one of the problems that we have with the church today is for whatever reason, we just keep our mouth shut. Maybe we got beat down too much. Even though you get beat down, the command to speak up for those who are the least of these still holds true. In fact, you need that command the more it holds true. We protest. We protect. Who do we protect? There are people in this city, there are people in this country that we know that are abused sexually. We know that there are people that are abused physically. We know that the poor get taken advantage of. One of the things that drives me crazy are these payday loan companies. I hate the practice. Okay? And well, it's, it's, it's their choice. It's the poor people's choice. You see, you see how we do this? We, we, we never step in somebody's shoes. Okay? We never try to get to know why exactly they do the things. You know why people go to those stupid payday loan places? Desperation. You know because they're desperate. Their power's getting ready to get shut off. They ain't got enough food right there. And, and they are desperate. So then you have these open doors, open minds. Doesn't matter what credit you have. Come in and we'll let you have you. They come in and they sign the papers. And at 400% interest, they lock their checking account up. It's like a drowning man reaching out for a hand. And the person who reaches out to grab them just wants to get a few licks in before they really go down. And they go down. They come into my office all the time. Going down, you ain't got money, I might as well get some out of yet too. I protest and I do whatever I can to protect them and even fight these other people. We protect, we pay. You know what tells me that you value something? That you will invest in it. If you will not invest in something, you do not value it. Your time. You visited me when I was in prison. You know, my schedule, sucks. It, it stinks. Sometimes it's very busy. All right? My wife will testify sometimes I'm working 80 plus hours a week, morning and night. You know, when I get a day off, okay, it's, it's still, those are the days that I can use to get caught up with stuff that I need to do. But um, why? There are a lot of hurt people. You brothers and sisters, my job is to minister to you so that you can be a minister to the world. The best thing that I can do is, is motivate you, encourage you to do the job that you're called to do. You need to do some business. You need to reach out to those people who are hurting right there. You need to be in the prisons. It takes your time. But it shows that you value something that God values. You pay with your you, you pay with money. Absolutely. I'll speak later on that later. I'm not going to go into detail on that right now. I think that you pay with your hearts. They were a stranger and you let them in. That's the hardest part of this. You know that? Opening up your door, opening up your heart to somebody. I open up my heart a lot to people. And sometimes they're just making the bad decisions and they make them over and over and over again. And I want them well. I want them to make the right decisions. And they still don't make those decisions. And it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart. I got brothers and sisters. You know, this is kind of fun. I got brothers and sisters. Uh, Brother Darren, did you talk today a little bit about commitment? We got brothers and sisters in this place right now that are struggling, that are going crazy. And we look around this room, and let's be perfectly honest, there are Christians in this room, and, and some of you are here right now, and, and, and you'll be gone next week, that are just not committed to Christ to the point where you're there. They struggle day in and day out. They're constantly struggling. I don't know why, and it breaks my heart because, you know, we're here for them. But too much of a, of a heartbreak. I care for people. The moment you open up your heart and you care for people, your heart's going to get broken. Is it worth the investment? Yeah. It is because God values it. Because God says, that's important to me. We value people because He valued them. Let me close. It's a matter of beliefs. It really is. It's a matter of beliefs. Because, remember, history tells you 
the belief system. Your history tells you your belief system. Okay? What you do reflects how you believe. Do you believe God's the creator? Do you believe he's all important? Do you believe he created humans? Do you believe that he values it? Well, then you should reflect that in how you view people, how you treat people. If you don't believe it, your values are going to change. My wife's going to be mad at me here in a second. That story I told was absolutely 100% true, except for one thing. There was no blue vase. I picked that up for 50 cents. Krista. Does anyone want to smash it? <laughs> I'm giving you five bucks. You want to smash it? Somebody else is going to take it, so you're going to take this. No, he's not. <laughs> would anybody have broke Krista's or busted her chops if she would have broke that? Because of the story I told. The story is absolutely true. That, that those tears that come from my eyes was absolutely true. My grandfather did that, but he never gave me a thing. Don't break it. Five bucks. For your free break. I break stuff all the time. What are they going to do? Break it. Man. <laughs> 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 Three, two, one, smack. There you go. I wanted to illustrate something. The moment you took away the value was the moment you changed your behavior. When it meant something, no. And it meant nothing to anybody in the first place. But it meant something to me. The minute you believed it, it was no longer of value to me at all. There were people lining up to destroy it. How you treat people is a direct reflection of the importance of God is in your life. You never forget that. Because your history testifies to your worldview, to your philosophy.